uh, role of prosecutors at Nuremberg, um, in particular, uh, and, and at recent trials. Uh, recall that Robert Jackson uh, was a justice on the United States Supreme Court who took a leave and went to Nuremberg as chief U.S. prosecutor. The, after the post-World War II uh, criminal courts, the first to be established were the United Nations International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. <coughs> and in selecting the chief prosecutor for that, those tribunals, it seemed particularly appropriate that you would find someone who was a justice on the Constitutional Court, and particularly a justice on one of the newest Constitutional Courts established. Richard Goldstone had just been appointed to the Constitutional Court of South Africa, was asked to become Chief Prosecutor, perform that role, and then went back. His career since then uh, has been illustrious. I don't you you have in the materials much of what he has done, but without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Richard Colson. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be at this commemorative uh, seminar and conference, on the, uh, and particularly to have the privilege of addressing this, this audience on the 60th anniversary of the Judgment of Nuremberg. Sharif Bassioni, uh, at dinner, after dinner last evening, referred to uh, United Nations bureaucracy, and I couldn't help but think that it almost prevented me from meeting Whitney Harris 11 years ago um, in the Nuremberg courtroom. I was then the chief prosecutor in The Hague, and the Lord Mayor of Nuremberg invited me and my wife and two members, and a member of my staff and his or her spouse to, to come to the 10th anniversary of the beginning of the Nuremberg trial and it was held in the, the opening uh, evening was held in the very courtroom which is still in use. The furniture has been moved around a little bit but it's still very much in use. Um, I accepted and the Deputy Prosecutor Graham Blue it wasn't available and I took uh, Gavin Ruxton and his wife Linda with me and uh, about three days before the Nuremberg Conference, I suddenly received a call from the chef de cabinet of the then Secretary General, Butrus Butrusgali. Three days before, he said, uh, I have a message for you from the Secretary General. So I said, oh, yes, what is it? He said, uh, he understands you're going to Nuremberg on whatever the day was, three days later, and I said, yes. He said, well, the message from the Secretary General is you may not go. And I said to Mr. Claude, Jean-Claude Amey, I said, well, Mr. Amey, what, for, for what reason? He said, I don't, haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> he said, I was just instructed by the Secretary General to give you that message. And I said, well, I'd better speak to him because I'm going unless there's a good reason. And he said, well, he's not here at the moment. And I said, well, when is he back? And he said, uh, later this evening uh, in uh, uh, the Hague time. And I said, well, you better tell him that I'm going unless he has a good reason for me not to go. And I said, I'm going out for dinner this evening. We were having dinner with, uh, with Steve Schwaber and his wife. And I said, I'm sure Judge Schwaber won't mind if the Secretary General calls me at his home. And I gave him the number. At 9.30 that evening, and during dinner, I was uh, getting myself worked up. And I thought, Judge Schwaber, if necessary, I would resign and go back to my seat on the Constitutional Court. Um, at 9.30, the telephone rang and Judge Schwabel answered it and he told me it was the Secretary General and he came on the line and I said, I have received this strange message from Mr. A. May, what's it all about? And he said, well, it's quite simple really. He said, you know, the United Nations is effectively insolvent. The United States at that stage had, with, was withholding its dues. And he said, I've just had to stop all UN officials traveling. He said, we just don't have money. And I said, but Secretary General, this is not costing the UN a cent. I'm going as a guest of the Nuremberg city. He said, oh, well, then there's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is the sort of micromanagement which was involved in you to organize the, the, uh, the UN. And I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to 
later because it is relevant to something I have to say to Sharif Bassioni's other story about my first visit to, to Rwanda. What I want to talk about, I, I, I've been sitting since yesterday tossing out all the notes I made uh, for, for, for this talk and what, what I propose doing is talking about some of the lessons and successes uh, from international prosecutions from Nuremberg until now to look at some of the roadblocks which have been set up and which are there very much unfortunately at the moment and, and, and to look a little bit into the, into the future. The, Lessons are many, and I'm going to, I hope, refer to some that are not as obvious and as frequently spoken about. The first one, which should be obvious, but is often neglected, is the politics, the politics, the politics. Without the politics, there wouldn't be in such a thing as international criminal justice. It was a political, these were political developments and political decisions, and that, that shouldn't be ignored. And it's the politics that create it, the politics that, that cause many of the roadblocks, and it's the politics that is going to have to remove the roadblocks or find a way, at least find a way around them. Let me tell you the Rwanda story in this, in this context. Uh, overnight, on the 23rd of November of 1994, I found myself not only the prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, but also Rwanda. The Security Council, for a number of good reasons, decided there should be one prosecutor and not separate prosecutors. In fact, there was some wag in one of the New York newspapers <coughs> who, who said Yugoslavia had been a tribunal without a prosecutor, whereas Rwanda is a, tri is a prosecutor without a tribunal. <laughs> and then that was a fairly accurate, accurate description. <coughs> but I decided that it was important, urgently, for me to visit Rwanda. The Rwanda government which had requested the tribunal, ended up not wanting it because the, the, the way it was being structured uh, was, was anathema to them. And they, they cast a single vote against the, the creation of their tribunal that they had requested because at that time they had a seat on the Security Council. And the, the fourth prize that was given to the Rwandese was that the prosecutor's office, but nothing else, would be in their capital of Kigali. So my task was to set up an office in the capital of a country that didn't want us. And it seemed to me crucial to get there as soon as possible and open discussions with the <laughs> President Wuzumungu and his deputy Paul Kagami and, and, and to get their cooperation. And I called the legal office and spoke to uh, the gentleman that Ralph Zapton referred to. Uh, and there was very little love lost between them for good reason uh, on, on Sharif's part. And I said to, I said to him, um, I think I must get to Rwanda quickly. And he said, well, we're all in good time, all in good time. He said he was the deputy head of the legal office. His, his boss, Hans Karol, was on, on vacation, unfortunately, at that time. And I said to Ralph Zapt, and I said, well, you know, I think it's urgent. In, in, I think the politics dictates that I should get there immediately. And he said, well, he said, there's no money for you to go. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, no money's been allocated yet for the Rwanda Tribunal, and nothing's been paid into the Secretary General's Trust Fund. So there's no money. <coughs> and he said, in any event, he said, I think that uh, a, a delegation from the head office should go first. So I'm going to go with, uh, with a team from UN headquarters. And I said, when are you going? And he said, well, I'm not sure. He said, uh, I, I'll, I'll let you know in a few days. Heard nothing from him. Three or four days later, I called him, and I said, when are you going to Kigali? This was now about the 1st of December. And he said, well, it won't be this year, probably, uh, maybe January, or more probably February. I said, Ralph, I, I'm going to go next week. And, and he again, he said, well, you, you, there's no money for your trip. And he knew I had to go with a couple of senior people from the office. And I said to him, can I raise the money? And I think he thought I was joking. And in his usual friendly fashion, he said, do what you like. And the next day, as it happened, I had a visit to Bern to meet with the, the then Swiss Foreign Minister, Kotti, uh, about the Yugoslavia tribunal. And during the course of our discussion, he said, what's happening with Rwanda? And I told him the story. Turned to his assistant and he said, go immediately and pay $100,000 into the Secretary General's Trust Fund. And he turned to me and he said, now you've got money to go to Rwanda. And I went two days later to, to Kigali, and it was crucially important. And, uh, 
uh, established immediately friendly relationships with the with, with the leaders of the Rwanda government, and they they did everything that I could have wished uh, to, to 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 give us. They gave us facilities, they gave us the office space, they gave us protection. When I got back to my office a week later in in the Hague, I found a rather curt note from the UN headquarters saying that it was it's unacceptable for senior officials of the United Nations to raise funds from member states. And I remember with great glee the very short response I said to him, Switzerland is not a member state. <laughs> but, but, but that was in fact that was in fact how I was able to to, to get to, to Rwanda. So the the politics is Putin and I think uh, 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 speakers this morning alluded to it either directly or by implication. I need hardly dwell on the development of humanitarian law. That's that this whole movement uh, because of and since Nuremberg, and importantly with it the withdrawal of impunity uh, for the worst war criminals. The other success of international criminal justice, Nuremberg and the more recent tribunals, has been that they have established what wasn't accepted. It's now no longer really questioned. They've accepted that international criminal courts can hold fair trials. It was doubt whether international judges from different countries, prosecutors from all over the world, could really work together in a way that would end up with, with trials that, that were fair. And that's now accepted. The Milosevic trial is as aberrational as, 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 as the O.J. Simpson trial is in the United States. You can't judge the, the criminal justice system in this country by the O.J. Simpson trial, I would suggest, any more than you can judge international criminal trials uh, in The Hague or in Arusha or anywhere else uh, by, what happens in the, by what happened in the Milosevic trial. So fair, fair trials are possible. And uh, 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 John Barrett referred uh, uh, earlier to to the importance of acquittals at Nuremberg and, and, and how, how that was regarded by Justice Jackson and many, many people as evidence of the fairness of the Nuremberg process that there could be acquittals. And I remember the, the, the rather ridiculous debate uh, when, when the uh, appeals chamber of the Yugoslavia tribunal uh, it issued an opinion uh, in the in in, uh, in the Krupasic case, and the, the the author of the opinion happily uh, is is uh, is with us at the conference. Uh, she, she she wrote the lead opinion, um, setting aside the the conviction in the trial chamber, and it wasn't and the politics of that wasn't easy because the author of the trial chamber uh, uh, decision was the president of the tribunal, Antonio Fasesi. And the, 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 the trial chamber had convicted long terms of imprisonment, and here the appeals chamber acquitted uh, on, the, uh, on, on, all of the, on all of the evidence. And media around the world built this as a terrible setback for the Yugoslavia tribunal, the decision of the trial chamber being upset on appeal. And my immediate reaction was, this is a great win. The fairness of any court system is judged not by the number of convictions, it's judged by the number of acquittals. And, 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 and that's, I think, a very, very important uh, plus which has been demonstrated uh, uh, starting at Nuremberg and, and continuing uh, in the, uh, in the uh, newer International War Crimes Tribunal. The next lesson to which I'd refer is the, is the fact that judicial bodies acquire a life of their own which are often very different from what their parents would have anticipated or wanted. Uh, they don't do the bidding of the uh, Security Council or the United Nations, uh, and that's been demonstrated. We demonstrated time and again, right from the beginning, I think the Tadic jurisdictional uh, opinion in the Appeals Chamber is a good example where the judges decided that they had the right to, to determine whether the Security Council would set them up and acted legally. It must have horrified some of the politicians on the Security Council. We create this body and now they're deciding, they deciding whether what we did uh, is legal uh, and, uh, and appropriate. 
So, so that and, 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 and the indictments of Karadzic during my term of Milosevic, indicted by my successor Louise Arbour, to the horror of many political leaders. I was I was really uh, 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 upbraided by by Butrus Ghali for issuing an indictment against Karadzic during the war. He said, "How can you do that?" He said, "You should have consulted me." And I said, "Mr. General, the last thing I thought it would be to consult you." The, the Security Council statute says I can take no orders from anybody, no government or any other person. And he said, no, no, he said, that's why I didn't speak to you. He said, you should have spoken to me. <laughs> no. uh, no, no. That, that was his conception of, of, of independence of the prosecution. Um, then the, the ending of impunity and the the topics the organizers gave me, which, which I was, which, which on inquiry, Lydus Sadat said, don't worry about it, it was intended to allow you to speak about whatever you want to speak about. It's called after impunity, uh, which is always a difficult, difficult task. But, but certainly the, the work of the international criminal tribunals has been successful in putting an end to what was universal impunity for war criminals. Before Nuremberg, there, was no, there were no laws and there were no courts. Uh, since Nuremberg, the laws have been refined, but there were no courts for almost 50 years. But since the ad hoc tribunals and the hybrid tribunals and so on, in many regions around the world, impunity has been withdrawn. Oppressive leaders who have committed war crimes in their own countries can no longer travel as, as freely as they did. Whether one refers to press reports of Suharto, the former dictator of Indonesia, cancelling medical treatment in Germany, uh, um, uh, Hail Mariam Mengistu from Ethiopia had to uh, leave a, 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 a clinic in my own country in Johannesburg because Human Rights Watch set up a hue and cry that he was in, he was, he was in South Africa and had left uh, the country Zimbabwe which had given him, inappropriately given him asylum. He left the, his clinic and went and to go and make do with Zimbabwean uh, medical treatment. Uh, Hassan Habre now again standing trial in, uh, in Senegal. This is a new world where, where oppressive leaders uh, have got to take uh, medical treatment at home and also go on vacation at home. And, that, and that's at least some, some good news and may, may act as some sort of deterrent. Clearly the greatest success in my view of, the, of criminal justice up to 1998 was the diplomatic conference that was called mainly at the behest of the United States uh, in Rome in 1998 to set up the International Criminal Court. Now, that wouldn't have happened but for the major successes of the uh, predecessors of the International Criminal Court. Had fair trials not been held, had, had the system not worked and broken down, I don't believe that there would have been an International Criminal Court up and running today and having the support of 102 members of the United Nations. Now it would be a far more enjoyable lunch if that was the end of the story. The successes and the ICC and I remember giving a talk in about 1999 where I sat down to tremendous applause because it was all good news. And of course it's not so easy and the road forward is a fraught one. Firstly the state sovereignty, which is a disease uh, which, which one understands, but is a problem for international justice, and particularly with regard to treaty-based courts. It's given rise to the peace versus justice debate, particularly in northern Uganda, and the difficulty that the ICC has been put into by President Museveni using the ICC like a hot water, for, like a hot water tap. You turn it on and you turn it off uh, as you wish. He turned it on by referring uh, the, the Lord Resistance Army and, uh, and, and, and the Uganda situation uh, to the International Criminal Court. Then when he wants a peace treaty, he wants to give an amnesty to one of the, uh, to, to four of the five uh, people indicted, the, the fifth one died, uh, unbeknown to the prosecutor, and, 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 and he wants, uh, he wants the, uh, the, the indictments, the arrest warrants to be withdrawn. But of course, justice and the international justice system can't work like that. You can't turn it on and turn it off uh, as you wish. It's a, again, 
if, if you refer a situation, it develops a life of its own. And, and, and I'm a little concerned that the International Criminal Court itself hasn't been more loudly heard condemning uh, the suggestion of amnesty for a person uh, in the position of Joseph Coney, who was committed on, the, on, on, the, on all of the evidence the most despicable uh, international war crimes against his, against his own people. And that, that must go ahead. And I was pleased to see last week, I think, in, uh, in The Hague, uh, Luis Moreno Campo saying that, that the prosecutions have to, have to proceed. Sudan, exercising its sovereignty and clear violation of its, its, its charter obligations under a Chapter 7 resolution, is, is, is refusing to, to cooperate at all with the International Criminal Court on the Darfur um, uh, reference. The question of the whole question of enforcement has come to the fore, and I would suggest that the whole future of international criminal justice is going to depend on whether orders of the International Criminal Court are by and large going to be respected and enforced or not. Because if they're not, the court's going to lose credibility, and if it loses credibility, it's not going to live. Uh, it, it requires credibility; it needs political support. It's not going to get it if countries like Sudan are going to be allowed by the Security Council to get away with, with, with the most blatant uh, uh, ignoring uh, and, and, and violations of their obligations. But perhaps, and I need hardly dwell on that too long, the most negative <coughs> roadblock at the moment is the present, or the present policies of the uh, Bush administration uh, and uh, its hostility not only to the International Criminal Court, but to, international, but, but, but to international law generally. At first I perhaps naively believed, and it's because of the regard in which I hold the United States and the people, at first I believed that the objection was solely one of principle, that the United States didn't want to subject its citizens to any foreign, uh, to any foreign court. But I see now that, that the, the, the present administration has a concern for its citizens being put on trial in situations where they have violated international criminal law. There's the recent attempt to, to, to rewrite for, for the United States only the provisions of common article three of, of, of the Geneva Convention. And importantly, and I'm, I, I cannot believe how little attention has been given to the provisions in the, in, the, in, the, in the Act, which is, I, I guess, being passed by Congress finally today and will be signed into law by President Bush next week. And that is a retrospective impunity, immunity, which, which the Act contains. It's retrospective to 1997. It's retrospective to 1997 to ensure that people at Abu Ghraib or elsewhere who committed, who committed war crimes are, are, are given an immunity from prosecution uh, in, the, in, in the United States. And again, th th this seems to be completely contrary uh, to everything that Nuremberg stood for and that Justice Jackson wanted to leave as uh, his legacy and the legacy of the court. Briefly turning to the future, will we return to the pre-Nuremberg days of impunity for war criminals? I believe not. I believe that there's room for optimism, maybe cautious optimism, but there are, there are uh, reasons to see light at the end of the tunnel. The first is the moral imperative. The first is that decent people, and most people in the world are decent people, don't, don't want war criminals to get away with it. And, and what's important is that these people who don't want war criminals to get, uh, to get away with it include the citizens of democracies. And if enough people in democracies want something to happen, eventually it happens. When there was a hue and cry in this country against the original military commission rules, they were changed by, by an administration that didn't like changing. But it was, the, it was again the, the, the public pressure that was put on the, on the administration that forced uh, the, the, the uh, initial rules of guilt, death sentence by majority, uh, and, and, and other rules that were complete anathema 
to the values for which this country stands, were withdrawn. And again, one sees last week, uh, one sees this week, uh, members of the Senate recognizing, on, on both sides of the House, recognizing the importance of reciprocity uh, in the law of war. And the fear that if, if, if the United States alters the laws to suit its, quote, war on terrorism, then uh, United States troops who are captured one day elsewhere are going to be faced with the, with the, same, with the same situation. So I believe that that's, that's changing. Uh, it's not changing perhaps as quickly as, as I would like and as many in this room would like to see, but I believe the pendulum has begun to swing back the other way. And it's going to continue to swing back the other way, I have little doubt. One sees too, and very importantly, the similar, similar voices of complaint uh, coming from the leadership uh, in the Pentagon itself. I, I've had the privilege of, uh, of addressing students at the, uh, at, at the Air Force Academy in, uh, in, in Colorado Springs. I've had the privilege of addressing students at the, at the uh, uh, war uh, at, at the, um, what's the, the, the school, the, 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 in, in, in Washington, the National, the, the National Defense University in, uh, in Washington. And on both occasions, I was struck by the openness, by the, by the level of debate, and, and, and no doctrinaire attitudes on the part of the students or the faculty. It wasn't what I expected going into those institutions. And, and I was struck too by the pride with which the military talk about their, their, uh, military uh, law and, and, and courts martials and how much they object uh, to being demeaned uh, by, by unfair rules being introduced into military commissions because they see themselves correctly being tarred, being tarred with the same brush. Most importantly perhaps the United States and other democracies would hardly enjoy living in a world without the rule of law. A world without the rule of law is not a is not a world in which there can be efficient international commerce. It's, it's not a world where, where the United States is going to continue uh, to, 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 influence, to influence other countries for, uh, for the good. The important endeavors of people, of the people sitting in this room, and many who, who not here should not be underestimated, is through their efforts that humanitarian law has become what it is, it's through their efforts that it's being taught in academies around the world where it was never taught. How many in this room have the opportunity at law school or at university of learning about humanitarian law? It was taught in some army colleges and some democracies. There are many, many law schools all over the Western world that are now teaching as humanitarian, humanitarian law. It's a new, it's a new industry. Until until recently, one never read about humanitarian law. The Geneva Conventions were some, uh, something people didn't know very much about, and certainly the media, journalists knew nothing about. One reads about war crimes tribunals and war crime situations daily in our newspapers, and we see debates about them on television and hear them on the radio. So it's being talked where it was never talked, it's being applied where it was never applied. And it's become a centerpiece, for example, in the whole uh, uh, debate about the unfortunate war in the Lebanon. So let me conclude by saying that we should applaud the lives of Whitney Harris, Ben Ferenz, and Henry King. Not only for what they achieved in Nuremberg, and again, I quote John Barrett, they won. But I think we should applaud them for staying the course and being a wonderful inspiration to so many people, and certainly to me, and I'm sure for many other people at this lunch, and again to use John Barrett's words, they not only have won, they will continue to win. Weeks <laughs> before the vote in the Security Council, the, uh, uh, David Sheffer's successor, Pierre Richard Prosper, made a public statement, I'm sure David will remember, he said the United States will not allow the reference of Darfur to the International Criminal Court because, he said, it will give that court credibility. And I, I think I'm quoting him accurately. And he was correct. 
the reference did give credibility to the International Criminal Court. And that was inconsistent with his instruction, uh, which was to do everything possible to withdraw credibility from the International Court. Why, why did the Bush administration not veto? It tried every possible way to avoid it. It was offering tens of millions of dollars to the African Union to set up some new court in Africa to do it. Callously, because it would have taken at least a year for the reasons David Craig mentioned, to set up another new court for Darfur uh, in Arusha. And why do that? Why spend tens of millions and waste a year when there's a, the, the International Criminal Court up and running, uh, willing and able to, uh, to take it on? Now, the, the, that was foreign affairs. I think, I think the administration realized that the United States would be would would really look ridiculous if it vetoed a reference of a situation that it had had uniquely declared to be genocide. You remember that Colin Powell was Secretary of State, and he he made the determination on behalf of the United States that what was happening in Darfur was genocide. So for the United States to to to, to veto an international criminal investigation into what it had declared to be a genocide would have been, would have been a, 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 a ridiculous situation. But the, the problems that led to that were internal. The, the, the Bush decision to, to do that wasn't made in, 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 in Africa or in Europe. It was made in Washington. It, was made in, it, it went that way in Washington because there were enough influential people who would have objected to the United States using its veto in, 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 in that sort of unprincipled way. So this, this is the strength of democracies, that, that, that people, people are free to speak. In this democracy in particular, and this is the, certainly without any question in my experience, the, open, the, the most open and the freest democracy, and people can speak without fear. There are many democracies where it's not as easy as it is in the United States to do that. And certainly in the United States, Foreigners like me can come and criticize your administration with a comfort level that I wouldn't experience anywhere in Europe. And so, so, so I, think, I think that's a very important plus and certainly one of the reasons I have for optimism. Huh? Uh, I'm John Washburn, convener of the American NGO Coalition for the ICC. I'd like to add one sentence of further explanation about the U.S. motives uh, for the abstention on Darfur. You're quite right that Secretary Rice uh, recognized that the international price for a veto of that resolution would be unacceptable to the interests of the United States. She also recognized that it would be touch and go whether, despite her very close relationship with the, with the President, uh, whether she could prevail to persuade him to do this. However, when she got to the White House, she discovered that the evangelical movement in the United States, an essential part of the right wing of the President's political base, had already called Karl Rove and said that our commitment in southern Sudan and Darfur uh, leads us to insist that you not uh, veto this resolution. So you were speaking about politics, and this is the political situation which brought that uh, very desirable result about. Uh, I do also have a question, which is that I would be grateful if you could address the peace versus justice dilemma uh, as a prosecutor, this was not one that you primarily had to deal with. Well, certainly, I mean, certainly not in the terms that, that the present prosecutor has to. Uh, and I would be, I know it's an enormous subject, but I would be grateful if you could identify some of the salient factors that go into addressing it. Well, I, I've got a fairly few, f f firm view about, about this. I don't believe that a prosecutor should have a dilemma at all. <clears throat> I think a prosecutor's job is to investigate and prosecute. That's what she or he is instructed to do. In the case of the ad hoc tribunals, that was the mandate uh, I was given by the Security Council and the reason I was employed, not to become a mini politician and decide on timings of indictments and, and whether to indict and whether to put it back. And I was faced with that, with, 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 with the Kuradich indictment. As I said, the Secretary General was furious for the, for the issue of the indictment at all at that time would have advised against it because he believed it was a political decision. I think he was wrong, but that's easy with hindsight. He thought it would make making peace more difficult. If Kuranich feared going to the Hague 
he wouldn't uh, wouldn't agree to a peace treaty. And that's the same position, that, that, that the same thing going on in Uganda. Louise Arbois had the political world fall on her when she issued the Milosevic indictment during the bombing, during the NATO bombing of Kosovo, over, uh, over Kosovo. And, and, and she issued the indictment. And in both cases, and it's happenstance, I agree that indictments could inhibit peace negotiations. No question about it. In the case of Kovacic, it helped the peace. Because Kovacic was indicted, Dayton could be held. If Kovacic hadn't been indicted, there would have been no Dayton. Remember, it was two months after the massacre of Srebrenica. There's no way that the Bosnian leaders would have sat in the same room as Kovacic in November of 1995. And, 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 they've said it, and they've said so very explicitly. So the indictment of Kovacic meant he couldn't go to Dayton because he, the, the, the United States would have arrested him and, uh, and sent him to the Hague. So he was forced to accept representation. It's ironic, but he was forced to accept representation by Milosevic. And Dayton, Dayton was successful and it stopped the war. In the case of the Milosevic indictment, people said, how can you indict him when we're trying to stop the bombing and getting him to, to agree? You may remember that Viktor Chernomir, the former uh, Prime Minister of Russia, representing the UN, and Marty Ohtisori, then President of Finland, were, were, were sent to, to get Milosevic to, 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 to capitulate and agree to the NATO terms. And when I was part of the Kosovo investigation, I, I, I met both Chernomirden and Artisari separately. Both of them said they were horrified when Luis Arbo issued the indictment. They thought, how can they go and negotiate with Milosevic with that hanging over his head? And both of them said they were wrong. They said it was never right. It was never on the agenda. It wasn't present to Milosevic's mind for good reason. Milosevic never in his wildest dreams thought he'd ever end up in the Hague. He was happy with medical treatment in Belgrade and, and holidays in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia. He wasn't a great world traveler. And he was convinced, <laughs> as, as many other people were, that as long as he stayed home, he would be safe from the clutches of the Hague. So in, in those cases, it didn't make any difference. Because of the indictment of Joseph Kony, as uh, I understand the situation in Uganda, it's, it, it's, it's been the arrest warrant that's forced Kony to start negotiating peace. And, 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 and the, 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 the thought that, it, that the prosecutor or the International Criminal Court should start going backwards because of that, it, it seems to me complete enough of it. It's not what they're there for. And if some peace is made more difficult because of arrest warrants, well, that's the price we have to pay for international justice. I think we have to look at the bottom line. Do we want a world with justice? with an international rule of law, with no impunity for war criminals, or, or, or do we not? If we think we're going to have a better ordered world, a more peaceful world with, with international criminal justice, then we have to do it and do it properly. Sir, last night at dinner you talked about your appointment as a prosecutor when you were in the court and comparing most inappropriate person to be appointed. Um, the, the reason was, for 15 months, there was no prosecutor. From May 93 until June of 94, eight nominees of Putuskali had been rejected by the Security Council. Russia vetoed five because they came from NATO countries. An American was vetoed because uh, he was a Muslim. Uh, 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 vetoed by the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom put up somebody objected to by Pakistan in retaliation for the UK vetoing a Muslim. <laughs> Sonia Sarabdi, the Attorney General of India, also vetoed by Pakistan. But the Security Council unusually decided that the prosecutor should be appointed by consensus. So there weren't five vetoes, there were 15. And in that atmosphere, right French judge suggested to Cassese that if they got somebody who was approved by Mandela, uh, it would go through. And that's how I was approached. I've been investigating uh, violence and criminality in my country for three years, and out of the blue I get this invitation, uh, and I, not for a moment, did I consider it was a good idea. <laughs> Firstly, I've never prosecuted, and they want me to prosecute. 
Thirdly, I knew nothing about humanitarian law, and that's the basis they want me to prosecute. And thirdly, I knew next to nothing about the former Yugoslavia, and that's the region I had to get involved in. <laughs> and I always, I always teased Sharif Bassioni, who had a great conspiracy theory at that time. Sharif's theory was that the, the, the tribunal was set up as this fig leaf to hide the shame of the West, but there was a conspiracy of the major power that it shouldn't work. And I said, Sharif, the best evidence of this you haven't used. And he said, <laughs> Uh, I, said, I said, it's very good evidence if, 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 if there was a conspiracy. But the, 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 it, it, any, any objections I had were, were, were put aside by the will of Nelson Mandela, who thought it was a good idea for a South African to, uh, to do this soon after our readmission, well, our admission to the international community after the end of apartheid. It was within months, of, a couple of months after his inauguration as our first democratic president. And he, had, he was forced to tell me that I was going to be appointed to our first ever constitutional court, uh, but that he wanted me to do this and my seat would be kept warm for two years and he discussed it with the Secretary General, they would accept that I come for two years and not for four years. So it was really being able to have my cake and eat it. And, and when I went to discuss it with my new colleagues on the court, they said, well, you know, it, it, is it appropriate that, that you've just been appointed with us to our highest court, to our new highest court? You're going to become a prosecutor. And, of course, I refer to Justice Jackson. And if, if this was acceptable for the for United States Associate Justice of your Supreme Court to become a prosecutor, who was anybody in South Africa to suggest the contrary? So it, it was an important, it was an important precedent, and certainly Nelson Mandela was very well aware of it. And uh, Louise Arbour subsequently told me that she had exactly the same problem when she was approached to become uh, the uh, the chief prosecutor. She said she had two precedents, and she said she had to use both of them uh, in order to modify her. Uh, her uh, uh, colleagues on then she was on the Ontario Supreme Court so, so it was a very important precedent and I'm not sure that it could have gone the other way but but for that uh, uh, precedent. Well, the constitutional amendment or something was required you say? Well, well in fact in fact Nelson Mandela had to amend the constitution to make it possible. It's called the Goldstone Amendment fondly in, the, <laughs> in some of the books but there were two two things had to be changed it was our interim constitution they hadn't made provision for a court, the 11 justices, so it would have meant all 11 have to sit. I couldn't go uh, off for two years uh, and, 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 and break a quorum. Obviously, if somebody was ill and unavailable, it would be a different matter. So the, the Constitution was amended to provide a quorum of eight. But more importantly, the Constitution was also amended to allow for acting justices to be appointed where justice was given leave of absence for a, a fixed period. And, and, and Sidney Kendrick, a great South African lawyer, in fact sat, sat in my seat for, for most of the period that, that I was away in the Hague. So it, 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 Nelson Mandela is a very imaginative, uh, forceful person, and, and, and really if he wanted something to happen, it happened. And it, it was really impossible to, uh, to, 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 refuse, to refuse him. And to an extent anathema, and it certainly wouldn't be allowed under, our, under the South African Constitution, is that the right of habeas can be removed from the court. Uh, and under our Constitution and, and the interpretation of the separation of powers, that could not happen. Because you, you, you in fact, taking away from one of the three organs of the state, powers that, that can only be exercised in a democracy by that by that organ of the state and that, that and that's fair trial. And, and and I'm shocked to see that, that the removal of habeas could uh, on on the interpretation many are giving uh, to this new legislation, a habeas can be removed not only from foreigners but also from United States citizens uh, who are declared uh, unlawful common. And, and that, that's something I never ever thought would happen in the United States. And what concerns me as a non-American and as somebody who, who reveres human rights and, 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 and dignity, 
is, is that the leadership role that the United States has played, the leadership role the United States played in the anti-apartheid movement in my country, is, is being blunted and, and, and is being reversed. And the United States is no longer seen as a leader of the free world because it's given up, it's given up that leadership role. Uh, Richard, along that same line, in the legislation this week, there's a there's a single sentence that says that in no case uh, pertaining to this legislation can a court refer to foreign or international sources right. of law as a basis for the judgment. Now, I know from South African cases that there's a liberal reference to U.S. Supreme Court cases, and we have always in our rule of law programs overseas taken great pride that other courts would refer back to our jurisprudence. Can you give us a South African perspective on how that would play reciprocally? Do you think that'll have a, an impact on how your judges and others might now look at U.S. law and, and precedents? Well, the, the South African Constitution makes, makes it much easier for our judges. Our Constitution has, a, has an interpretation provision, section 39, which is in the chapter containing the Bill of Rights. It provides that interpreting the Bill of Rights, every court from forum tribunal must have reference to international law. Not may, must. You're obliged to consult international law. Not bound by it, but you're obliged to consult it. And our constitutional court has interpreted that to mean international law broadly, not international law that South Africa has acceded to, not only customary international law, but we can look at the European Convention, at the American Convention, uh, and, and, and any international law of the International Labour Organization. We, we, we are obliged, in a, in, if, if it's relevant, to consult international law. And then there's an invitation in Section 39.1 it said, and may consult foreign law. So, so we have an invitation, and we, we, we've taken that invitation uh, very seriously, not, not as a command, but seriously, and it's been a tremendous learning experience. Let me say one, one important thing, though, to an American audience. It's different, there's a different need for a new constitutional court to consult foreign law than there is for an old court. You have precedents and your courts are bound to follow them. It doesn't need to reinvent uh, new precedents every time the question comes up. And my guess is in 50 years or 100 years from now, the South African Constitutional Court will be consulting foreign law less than it is today. We're creating a new system, and it's very useful for us to be able to learn uh, from, from other democracies. And our constitution too, uh, if, for example, the, uh, our, uh, we've adopted the Canadian uh, approach to the Bill of Rights, where all rights are expressed in the broadest terms, and there's a limitation provision. The Constitution says that the rights in the Bill of Rights can be limited by a law of general application, and, and it has to be in a manner that's consistent with other, democracy, <coughs> other open and free democracies. So we're forced to look around and see what other democracies do. And it has to be the least invasive way of doing it. So it, it sets out, as I said, very similar to, to Section 1 of the uh, Canadian Charter. So there, too, we throw in into comparative constitutional law. The Constitution also provides, the, the, the South African Constitution, that in interpreting legislation, any reasonable interpretation consistent with international law shall be preferred over any other interpretation that's inconsistent with international law. So even if the best interpretation is inconsistent with international law, you have to prefer a, a less good interpretation uh, that, that is consistent. So, so there, is a, there, there is a pecking order and a respect for, for international law, and, and, and this goes in the opposite direction to the, the instruction here given by Congress uh, to the courts uh, that, that they may not have regard uh, to, 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 to any international law in interpreting, including the, the, the meaning of the Geneva Convention. And I, even, even Justice Scalia would cavil at that. Justice Scalia, as much as he hates foreign laws, says that when it comes to interpreting international treaties, 
the United States Supreme Court must look at what other courts are doing because you don't want treaties interpreted differently in different countries. And, and that's, exactly, that's exactly what this, unfortunately, it seems to me, uh, what, uh, what unfortunately it does. One more. <coughs> this is really more a political question <coughs> than a legal question. What was happening uh, in, in Namibia so much, but what, what was happening in, in, in our part of the world? Uh, the the, the anti-apartheid movement uh, was, was gathering steam. It wasn't only sanctions and divestment and disinvestment, but it was blood in our streets. Everybody referred to South Africa as a peaceful transition. 20,000 people died during the transition. It was comparatively peaceful. We would have had a bloodbath with hundreds of thousands killed had apartheid continued. And one thing I have no doubt about, the, the reason apartheid came to an end wasn't because the last apartheid president, de Klerk, had a change of moral hop. He didn't suddenly convince himself that apartheid was immoral. And when he apologized for apartheid before our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Archbishop Titu had tears running down his eyes, and I discussed it with him. I said, you, you were frustrated and brought to tears because de Klerk's apology was for the apartheid policy because it failed, not because it was immoral. And he, he said, that's exactly, he said, you put it exactly correctly. De Klerk realized, fortunately, that apartheid was going to lead to the end of his people that his people were going to die by the hundreds of thousands if apartheid didn't come to So it was very pragmatic. And, 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 and thank goodness, had he gone to his people and said, my dear people, we must abandon apartheid because it's immoral, he wouldn't have been the, their leader for more than 24 hours. When he went to his people and said, my dear people, we must give up apartheid because we're going to die, that, that they could realize, and they all went with it. So, then what happened in Namibia at least showed the possibility of another way? No, I don't think so. You know, the, 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 <coughs> the white minority in Namibia was so small, it didn't really make a difference. And I don't think there was 1% of the people of Namibia were, were white people in South Africa. It's a very different situation. And I don't, I've, I've never heard, and I don't know that that, was a, that, that made a crucial difference. Thank you. Thank you.